come back to the month. End of the month of Elul. So I don't need to tell you, nobody, nobody's a stranger to Elul. We're ready to spend the week in Elul. As everyone knows the feeling of Elul as we wind down the year. And you know that the Sefer Yitzira, the Book of Creation, explains that all of the world was created in such a way of a server of notes tchilasim b'seifah that the end is connected to the very beginning. There's the beginning, <coughs> and then the beginning proceeds till the end, <coughs> and the end goes right back to the beginning. And that's because the secret of that is because since God is a true infinity that includes all details, so therefore everything is connected to everything else in a very deep way. And especially the end and the beginning. And therefore you understand that the end of the year is the preparation for the beginning of the year, not only because, let's do it again, it was good the first time, let's try it again, but because really, in a very deep way, to be able to enter the new year the secret of that is in the end. The, be- the ability to reach again the beginning, to go back to the highest place, comes from the lowest place, because the secret of the circle, the secret of the chayzer chalil, the secret of Ein Sof, is that the ability to reach the beginning comes from the end. And that we see very clearly on our calendar. The way that our the Jewish year is, it's very clear. Why is that? You know that in our calendar, in our year, our lives are based on the weekly Torah reading, the weekly parsha. The Alter Rebbe said the Jew has to live with the times. You all know the story. The Alter Rebbe made a comment to the Chassidim that a Jew has to live with the times. Now this was a time, you know, the Alter Rebbe was at the beginning of, it was at the time of the, of the Enlightenment. You know, when living with the times wasn't something that Jews, you know, liked to do. Jews always liked to be old-fashioned. Living with the times wasn't a popular thing to say. Until the Alter Rebbe's brother explained what the Alter Rebbe meant when he said to live with the times, he means to live with the weekly parish. And what's very interesting to pay attention always, one of the ways if you want to get an idea of what the parish is all about, is the Haftar. The Haftar, the portion of the prophets that we read at the end. The weekly Haftar, why? Because you all know when, when did the Haftar begin? What caused the Haftar? What, what, how did that start? It was a time that there was a Roman persecution and we weren't able to read from the Torah scroll. We weren't able to read from the Chumash. So the rabbis instituted to read instead a portion of the prophets, a portion of the prophets, and that portion, that Haftar, so to speak, gives the flavor of the whole Pasha. And that's what my Maimonides writes, that's what the Rambam writes, that the Torah is me'ein ha-parsh. It's what the parsh is all about. Except, anyone know what the exception is? The Rambam, my Maimonides himself, Shukhan also brings it. The Rambam says, which parshis are an exception to the rule? Anyone know? The Rambam says, the last ten weeks of the year. The last ten weeks of the year, the Torah. The portion of the prophets is not based on the parsha. Of course, the, the Sfarim explained there's a deeper connection between them. Of course, we can always find the connection. But the reason for reading the last ten weeks, the last ten portions of the prophets, is not because of the parsha. Rather, we have the three weeks before Tisha B'av, known as the Tlosa de Pranusa, the three portions of calamity, the three bad. Puranus, the three bad portions that refer to that are the warnings about the destruction, the imminent destruction of Tisha. That's the plus of the Puranus, the three portions of calamity that precede Tisha. And then after Tisha, always there are seven Shabbos from Tisha to Rosh Hashanah. Always. And those seven weeks from Tisha to Rosh Hashanah is known as. The Shiva de Nechemte, the seven portions of consolation, of comfort. Seven weeks in a row that we read portions from Yeshaya Hanovi, so Shlem used to call him the Holy Prophet Isaiah. From Yeshaya Hanovi, we read seven weeks in a row 
portions shivet the nechemta, nechom, consolation, comfort. And you all understand what that means. What does that mean? That how do, how do we end the year? The year is sort of like what Jewish history is all about. The year is a microcosm of what all Jewish history is all about. Jewish history is all about coming back just like before creation. God was the only thing that existed. We're about we're all about coming to Mashiach, which is again the time where the revelation that God is the only thing that exists, but that should be revealed in the world. And if we talk in Jewish history, so so too Jewish history is all about the birth, the beauty of the, Jew, the, of the Jewish history. When we first were born, God showed us miracles. God showed us His love. God showed us how much He loves us. That was the birth of the Jewish people. We had a great childhood. The Jewish nation had a great childhood. If we need therapy as a nation as a whole, it's not because of our childhood. You know, most people that need therapy, in, you know, is to be able to blame your parents. Right? Psychologists make much of their money that people are able to, you know, make fun of their parents and blame pick from their parents and blame their parents. But the Jewish people, our childhood was beautiful. It was our adolescence and our adulthood and our 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 our, our senior years that have been pretty rough. And especially our senior years, especially when we, you know, we, in old age, we, we haven't been doing very well. But Jewish history is all about what? Coming back to the time of consolation. Coming back to Mashiach. Coming to that time again that God is again going to show us His love. The end is going to be like the beginning. Just like when we were born, He's going to once again show us openly His love for us. And that's the Jewish calendar. The end of the Jewish calendar is the seven last weeks of the year are the seven weeks of consolation. Shiva din The seven weeks where God consoles us again and tells us how much He loves us. And that allows us to once again begin the year again, Rosh Hashanah. So that means that we have to take from the portions of the Haftorah the portions that we read from the prophets, these seven weeks, that is what's going to give us the ability to once again enter Rosh Hashanah to begin the year again. It's these weeks where God tells us His love for us. He gives us the consolation. He shows us that the imminent end of Jewish history is going to be as beautiful as the beginning. That's how we enter Rosh Hashanah. So I want to begin to understand these seven portions, the Shivanah, the Nechemta, with an unbelievably beautiful idea from the Abu Dhrab. The Abu Draham was a Rishon, one of the Rishayim, one of the medieval commentators. He's most famous for his commentary on the Sidur, on the Sib. And the Abu Dhrab has a part, has an idea about these seven portions, which the, the Rebbe, the Rebbe, the Rebbe, the Rebbe, the Rebbe, the Rebbe, would say over this idea every single year, at least once, if not more. Listen to this idea from Abu Dhrum. The Abu Dhrum takes the first words of all the seven portions and turns them into a story, into an anecdote. The story of our lives, not just a story. What are the seven portions of these seven weeks? Everyone knows the first Shabbos after Tisha B'Av is what? Shabbos Nachamu. Nachamu, Nachamu, Ami, Yoimer, Alikeif. Be comforted, be comforted, my nation, say, 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 so says God. Happens to be my Bar Mitzvah parasha on a personal note. Shabbos Nachum. Then the second week, the second week, is which, how does it begin? Vatoymer tziyoy nazavani Hashem vashem shcheichon. And Zion has said, the Lord has forgotten me. Hashem has forsaken me. The third week begins Aniya Sayara Loinuchama. A tempest tossed poor poor one who cannot be consoled. A tempest tossed poor one that cannot be consoled. Referring to us. The fourth one, which we just read this past Shabbos, is Anoichi Anoichi Humenachemchem. God says, I, I will come for you. And then this coming Shabbos, 
is Rani Akkara Layulada. Be re rejoice, barren one that has not yet given birth. The sixth one, next Shabbos, is Kumi Oiri Kiba Oirich. Rise up and shine for your light has come. And then finally, the seventh, the last Shabbos before Rosh Hashanah is always Sois Osis Bashem. Sois Osis Babai. I will rejoice in God. So listen. Listen how the Abudram weaves them together in a beautiful tapestry. Listen what he says. After Tishabah, after all the Jews went through, Hashem sends His prophet to the Jewish people. He sends His prophet to the Jewish people and tells the prophet to tell the Jewish people, Nachmu, Nachmu, Ami, Yoimer, Aleikeichem. Be comforted, be comforted, my nation, so says God. In other words, listen carefully, Hashem sends His prophet to the Jewish people to comfort them. And the prophet says, to the Jewish people, Yeshai, the prophet says to us, Nachmu, nachmu, ami yoyver aleikeichem. The prophet is quoting God. Be consoled, be consoled, my nation, so says God. The Jewish people hear that God sent his prophet to comfort us. And we say, a prophet? A messenger? After all we've been through, he sends us a messenger? That's it? A messenger? Imagine, you know, it's, a, it's your wife's anniversary. It's your anniversary. It's your anniversary. And you get stuck at work or something. So you send, you know, you send a friend of yours, please send a friend, could you please tell my wife happy anniversary? You could be sure that uh, if you're lucky, you'll be thrown out of the house for three weeks. If you're lucky. I'm a messenger. So Jewish people say, Zion says, the Lord has forsaken me. Hashem has forgotten me. And the prophets hear that the Jewish people are not content to hear from a messenger or go between. So the prophets go back to Hashem and say, the third parsha, A tempest to us, poor one, she will not be consoled. She's not getting consoled from us. And so the fourth week, Hashem says, we just read this Shabbos, Anoichi, Anoichi, Humanachemchem. God says, I, I will comfort you. I'll do it myself. And then the next two weeks are God's comfort, where God speaks to us directly. And He says, Rejoice, barren woman that has not yet given birth. Kumi Arise and shine, your light has come. And then, the seventh week, always the last Shabbos for Rosh Hashanah, we the Jewish people finally say what? Sois osis vavai. I will rejoice in God. And you all understand what does that mean? That the consolation of the Jewish people is that we're never going to be content with anything less than God. I saw recently in a book someplace, a book that says, that the Jewish people are waiting for Mashiach. And when Mashiach will come, we will all merit to have visions of the divine throne. So I just saw in a book recently that when Mashiach comes, we're going to merit to have visions of the divine throne. That's incorrect. We're not going to have just visions, and it's not just going to be the divine throne. We will not be content with anything other than God Himself. Sois osis babai. The ultimate consolement to the Jewish people is going to be Hashem Himself. God Himself. No messengers, no angels, no worlds, no levels. God Himself. I want to learn a little bit more in depth what that means. I want to talk about that a little more in depth. What does it mean? Our consolation is the whole year is the, the bottom line of the whole year is So listen. This week's Haftarah, which as we just mentioned, is the first of the two that God says to us. Right? This past Shabbos, God said to us, anoichi, anoichi, I, I will comfort you. And then the next two weeks is God's consolation. He comforts us. This week's Haftarah is one of the most beautiful psukim, in my personal opinion, in all of Nach. 
One of the most beautiful psukim in the Bible. And the Alter Rebbe in the Kute Torah has a mimer that's as beautiful explaining the post. Listen to the post. One of my all time favorite psukim. Listen. The post says, Ki herhorim yamushu vagvois temoitena vechazdi miiteich loyomish. The mountains may crumble and the hillsides will fade away, but my love for you will not end. The mountains will crumble and the hillsides will fade away, but my love for you will not end. What does that mean? What's God saying? And even though the mountains will crumble and the hills will fade away, my love for you will not end. So I want to learn with you how the author explains this possible, but I need to make an introduction. In order to really appreciate what the author ever says, so I want to first make a parenthetical introduction. I want to learn with you a sicha from the Rebbe. A sicha from the Rebbe, the Baruch Rebbe. A sicha that the Rebbe explained about Elu, about our avoidance now in the time of Elu. And then we'll be able to tie it in together how the Alter explains that possible. So this time of Elu, so you all know, I'm sure everyone's familiar with, that Elu, there's probably no other word in Judaism that has as many Russian tapes, that has many acronyms. I just heard today a friend of mine, Aguirre Chassid, just told me today that in, in Warsaw, in Poland, they used to say that Elu stands for Allah lover veren light. Allah lover veren light, which means all bums become gentlemen. Allah lover veren light. All bums become gentlemen. That's how they used to say in Poland. That's what Elu stands for. And in the light, you know, Chassidim say that. Chassidim say that by the Misnagdim, by the Hasidically challenged Jews, Elu stands for Oili Vavoili. What's going to be? Oili Vavoili. There's a lot of acronyms given. But you know that the, the standard Rosh Hashanah acronyms of Elu, <clears throat> there are five. Five acronyms, the famous acronyms. First of all, we all know that as Pirkei Ovis says in the beginning of Ethics from Sinai, the first, first chapter, that the world stands on three pillars, right? The world stands on three pillars. What are the three pillars? Torah study, charity, and prayer. Right? L has acronyms for those three. Torah study, L stands for I made a city of refuge for those that kill unintentionally. Torah is a city of refuge. Torah is the place of refuge where we take Refuge, when we're being chased by the elements. Tfila, prayer, is ani l'doidi v'doidi li. I, my beloved, my beloved is mine, which is prayer. Then is chesed, is stoko, is matone ish l're'eyu matone slav yoinim, which is the verse that says in the Megillah, about matone slav yoinim, ish l're'eyu matone slav yoinim. That's Torah, prayer, and charity. Then there's another Rosh Hashanah for tshuva, repentance, tshuva. What's that Rosh Hashanah? It says in Parsh in Nitzavim, the end of Deuteronomy, Umol Hashem Alekecha Es Levavcha VeEs Levav Zarech. God will circumcise your heart and your offspring's heart. That's Es Levavcha VeEs Levav Zarech. That's repentance. And then finally, the fifth one is Geula, redemption. It said we say in Az Yashir in the, in the song by the sea, Ashira Lashem Vayoyru Leimu. Elul stands for Ashira Lashem Vayoyru Leimu. I will sing to God. The song of the sea was redemption. Now listen carefully. So I want to learn with you the sicha from the Rebbe from Re'ei Toshim Memches. 1988. This is a beautiful idea. Listen. What's the connection of these five things? Torah, prayer, charity, and then repentance and redemption. How do they fit together? So on the simple level, we understand 
that our avoida, our serving Hashem, is Torah, prayer, and charity. That's serving Hashem. That's what we do to serve Hashem. Learn Torah, pray, charity. Charity also refers to all the mitzvahs, the physical mitzvahs we do. What about repentance? What's repentance? Repentance is usually understood to be in case of emergency, break glass. Right? Repentance is always, it's usually meant to, it's, it's usually looked at as you know, a consolation prize. Just in case. It was like, Devin, you know, remember the old game shows? You know, it was Ed McMahon. But they, they said, one guy wins, you know, oh, he wins five million dollars, and then they say, the runners up, oh, don't worry, you get a blender. You know, we have, we have, for, the, we have for the runners up a microwave oven or something. Don't feel bad. You might get five million dollars. You're going to get a new washing machine. It's a consolation prize. So tshuva is just in case, in case you mess up, you didn't do Torah, prayer, and mitzvahs properly. You have repentance and redemption. What's that? Redemption is what is the purpose of everything. What we're headed towards. The purpose of everything. That's how, simply how we understand. But the Rebbe said, the Rebbe said, on a deeper level, repentance, tshuva, and geula, redemption, are not just to fix if you messed up, and the purpose of everything, but they're also part of our avayim. They're also part of serving Hashem. In other words, there's a way of serving Hashem regularly, a higher level of serving Hashem is serving Hashem in a way of repentance. And then even deeper is serving Hashem in a way of redemption. Repentance and redemption are ways of serving God. What does that mean? What does that mean? So we all know that the ultimate, the ultimate Rosh Hashanah, the acronym of Elul, is Ani Ledoidi Vedoidi Li. I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. And here, fascinating, the Rebbe explains, listen carefully, we're going to now learn in the words, what does it mean, Ani Ledoidi? I am my beloved. And the Rebbe says three explanations in the words, Ani Ledoidi. I am my beloved. What does it mean, I am my beloved? What does it mean, I am my beloved? Ani l'doi. I am my beloved. What does that mean? So the first thing, you know, build, let's build the ladder of serving Hashem. Let's build the ladder of all the levels of serving Hashem. Now until now, keep in mind, we said this Torah prayer and, and mitzvahs, that's serving Hashem. Higher than that is serving Hashem in a way of tshuva, repentance, Higher than that is serving Hashem in a way of Gi'ula, of redemption. But even before Torah, mitzvahs, and prayer, there's a level that comes first. And what's that? Kabbalah's all mouth Shaman. Accepting God as king. Now, all these levels, you understand, listen carefully, all these levels are really a hachana, a preparation to be able to, to come to Rosh Hashanah. As we spoke about that this end of the year is the time that we prepare for Rosh Hashanah. So you also understand that in Rosh Hashanah, these three explanations of Ani L'doidi, Kabbalah Somach Hashanah, which comes before Torah, Mitzvahs, and prayer, accepting the yoke of heaven, which is going to be the first explanation of Ani L'doidi, and then Ani L'doidi of Tshuva, and Ani L'doidi of Geula, all of these are what Rosh Hashanah is all about, and Elul is a preparation for that. Sounds a little complicated, but let me explain. What's the first thing that we know Rosh Hashanah is famous for? What's Rosh Hashanah all about? Rosh Hashanah is the first two days of the year. What's the first thing a Jew does in the beginning of the year? And by the way, every day is the same thing. Every day, the beginning of the day, Moida'ani, or the beginning of Davening, Hoidu Hashem is the same thing as the beginning of the year, Rosh Hashanah. What's that? Making God king. You know that Rosh Hashanah, the whole day, is the day that we coronate God as our king. We make Hashem our king. 
the day that we call it Hashem as king. In Chesidus Chabad, it's known as Yoim Hach Toros HaMelech, the day of the coronation of the king. We actually make God king. Now, when a nation makes a king, so what's the first, how does the nation coronate a king? By subjugating themselves. Kabbalah Somach Shmaim, accepting the yoke. And what does that mean, accepting the yoke? Serving God in a way of Kabbalah Somach Shmaim does not mean serving God by rote, as a robot. That's not what it means. What does Kabbalah Somach Shmaim mean? How does the nation make the king a king? by completely giving themselves over to the king. I give myself over to you. I am your subject. And that Rebbe says, that's the first explanation. Ani le I give myself over to God. I become God's subject. Ani le I subjugate, I give myself over to God. The first step before I do a mitzvah, before you pray, before you do a mitzvah, before you learn Torah, there's a deeper thing which is the foundation, just like any king, that the foundation of his kingdom is that his subjects accept him as king. Ani lidoi, I give myself over to, my, to, to God. I accept him as my king. That's the foundation. That comes before Torah, prayer, and, and, uh, and mitzvahs. But, <clears throat> the Friedrich Rebbe, the Rebbe Ayatz, wrote in a mimer that just like a, a human king, the day of the coronation, sound, is that a happy day or a sad day? So in history, historically, the days of coronation was besimcha gedoy, was with great joy. Umal, what do we say every night by mimer? Umal chusoy berotzen kibloday. We accept God's kingship willingly. It's not that we're forced. God's not a dictator. In other words, it's not enough just to accept God as king. That's not enough. That's the beginning. The first meaning of Elul is to work on making God our king, which is giving ourselves over to God. I want, I want, you, I want to make this a little more clear, this idea. You know, in Orthodox Judaism, it's very easy to get caught up with thinking that being an Orthodox Jew means doing things. We follow Shulchan Aruch, and the Shulchan Aruch is a huge list of do's and don'ts. What we're saying is that Kabbalah Sonoch Hashemayim, accepting God as King, which is the beginning of every day, and what Rosh Hashanah is all about, is that before you do anything for God, or before you don't do something because God said not to do it, there's such a thing as giving oneself over to God. I give myself over to Hashem. I give myself over to the king. But then there's an even higher level, which is, okay, I gave myself over to the king. And I'm going to learn Torah and I'm going to do mitzvahs. But in what way? In what way do you give yourself over to the king? So here the Rebbe looks at the word, Ani Lidoidi, with the second explanation. Ani Lidoidi, so he says, Ani Lid, I give myself over to. But to whom? Doi, my beloved. My beloved. Love. Elul is a time to work on loving the king. It's a time on working to become crazy about God. I just had an, I just had an argument with a friend of mine a couple of days ago for bringing him. So he said, do we in Judaism, do we believe in being obsessive compulsive? Now I've heard from psychologists that you know, if, you, if you do Orthodox Judaism, if you do Shulchan Aruch wrong, you can really end up being obsessive compulsive. There are people, it it's, 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 it's definitely can make a person obsessive compulsive if you, don't, if you don't know what you're doing, right? So I'm not talking about being obsessive compulsive by like, you know, uh, getting pale if you accidentally touch your shoe in the middle of davening and like fainting and stuff like that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about being obsessive compulsive about God. I'm not being obsessed with God. I need the, having a beloved. By the way, if anyone here has not yet read chapter 10 of Maimonides' Laws of Repentance, 
Do not pass go, do not collect 200. Required reading. Don't go to sleep tonight. If anyone here has not read chapter 10, anyone that thinks that Maimonides is like a cold-blooded philosopher, <clears throat> if you have not yet read chapter 10 of the Laws of Repentance of Ilfus Chuba, do it before you go to sleep. You have to become lovesick with God. I give myself over to God, but to whom? To my beloved. You have to become crazy about God. You all know the Alter Rebbe's famous marshal, his famous parable of the king in the field. That's what Edel was all about. The rest of the year, the king is in his palace, and you need to get through guards, and you need to make preparations. Elul, the Alter Rebbe says, basically, Ariza, the revelation of God, which is on Yom Kippur, is during Elul, but in a mundane way. The king is in the field, and he receives everyone with a, with a smiling face. <clears throat> And he shows everyone a beautiful countenance. It's a time to arouse the love of Hashem. That's what Elul is all about. <clears throat> and I want to just tell you, tell you, somebody sent me an email, I just saw it today, somebody sent me a link to H.com, an article on H.com, a whole article that the theme of Elul is working on getting closer to God and being in love with Hashem. And they bring the Moshe of Melech Besodah of the king in the field. Bar Hashem, the well springs have spread out. And Bar, I was warm my heart to see. Because I, I mean, I, and Bar Hashem, but it wasn't like that when I, I'm not that old. When I was in Yeshiva by the Litvish Yeshivas about 15 years ago, that's not how they explained Elul. It was still the good old Lithuanian Elul of, you know, get nervous, you have a court case coming up and they're going to decide whether you're going to die who by fire, who by water, who by strangulation. In my days it was still the good old McCoy, you know, the Lithuanian men. But today Baruch Hashem, it's on age.com, that Baruch Hashem, everyone knows that El was the time to work on being in love with Hashem. Ani Lutoid! And that, listen carefully, that's what it means to serve God in a way of repentance. Repentance is a way of serving God. Tshuva, what does tshuva mean? To return to God. And here I refer you to Tanya chapter 31, where the Alter Rebbe brings what Rebbe Eliezer says in the Gemara in Shabbos, kol yamecha b'tshuva. Rebbe Eliezer says the Gemara in Shabbos, Talmud teaches, every day you should do tshuva. Now if tshuva means to repent for a sin, well, what does that mean? Every day you should do tshuva. So the Alter Rebbe explains there in Tanya chapter 31, what that means is, tshuva, repenting, returning to God, is a movement of the soul. The Alter Rebbe says that you have to meditate, imagine a prince that's been far away from his father, the king, for, for a long time, and he now comes from prison back to the palace to his father, the king. Imagine his joy and the king's joy. That's tshuva. And that happens every time we do a mitzvah. We return to our father, the king. That kavana, that intention, that feeling of serving God in a way of coming back to God, of connecting to God, that we have to work on in Elul, that's serving God in a way of truth. So seemingly, what could be greater than that? Love, I'm crazy about God, obsessed with God. We have to become obsessed with God. By the way, just to clarify, so I shouldn't get any mental issues here. Being obsessed with God doesn't negate being involved in things in this world. But what? It means making God a part of all. But you'll understand better in a second. So we said, okay, so now this Ani Lidoidi, Ani Lidoidi, Kabbalah's Mokshmai, which is the foundation, I give myself over to God. That's Ani Lidoidi. Doidi, my beloved, that's serving God in a way of love, of wanting to become close to Hashem. What could be greater than that? I'm crazy about God, I'm in love with God, I'm doing Torah mitzvahs in order to connect to Him. What could be higher than that? Serving God in a way of redemption. Ge'ul, the fifth Rosh Hashanah. What does it mean to serve God in the way of redemption? What could be higher than being in love with God? So 
listen. The Rebbe says a beautiful idea. One of the most beautiful ideas I ever saw. Listen to this. If you accept the king as king, when we, let's talk about for a second a physical king. Physical nation and a physical king. And we're talking about a king who's a mighty king. A great mighty king. That rules over many other kings. And has millions of people in his kingdom. A powerful king. Is the king aware of everything that happens in his kingdom? In the private lives of his subjects? As mighty of a king as he is, even if he's a communist, Big Brother is watching, the king is not aware most of what goes on in his subjects and the lives of his subjects. More than that, most of the things that happen in the kingdom doesn't interest the king. That's mitzad, that's from the side of the king. What about from the side of the subjects? As loyal as the subject is, and here I need to, I need to tell you the words the Rebbe says in Hebrew, because very unusual, there was such a beautiful, beautiful poetic lesson. He says that the most loyal subjects don't live in such a way that even the most loyal subjects don't live in such a way that all their desire and all their being and all their interest and focus is to fill the will of the king. They don't live in such a way. The most loyal subjects. Their private lives is not all about the king. Redemption means being redeemed from having any separate entity from God. Being crazy with lo- in love with God, you and God are still two separate things. Redemption is being redeemed from being in a state of being separate from God. You might be in love with someone, love sick with the person, but you and that person are two separate places, two separate things. And therefore, the ultimate Kabbal Samal Hashemayim of Hashem, making God king, is in a way of being one with Him. That every detail of our life is not just for Him, but is Him is nothing other than His light. To come to live in such a way where you feel that your whole being is nothing other than God's light. Complete unity. And that's why you all know. Rosh Hashanah. You all know what's the longest Shemayna of the year, the longest Amidah of the year. Musaf and Rosh Hashanah. You all know part of being Jewish is having your feet hurting you on Rosh Hashanah. Unless you're very skinny, right? My little kids already complained last year. But Rosh, Musaf and Rosh Hashanah, you stand there, especially if you blow shayf in the middle. It's a good 20, 25 minutes, yeah? Why is Musaf and Rosh Hashanah so long? Because we say the 10 verses of kingship, the 10 verses of remembrance, and the 10 verses of shayf. Now, what are the rules? The 10 psukim malchis, the 10 verses of kingship. We know what does the Gemara say? You need three psukim from Chumash, three psukim from Navi, Three psukim from the writings, and what's the tenth? No? Again from Chumash. Yeah? Now who remembers in Rosh Hashanah? We say three psukim from Chumash, Hashem Yimlach Leilam Boer, Vayib Yashurun Melech. Then we say, and then we say after, Vayib Yashurun Melech, Vayib Yashurun Melech, Vayib Yashurun Melech, Vayib Yashurun Melech, Vayib Melech, Vayib What's the tenth final psukim of Malchus on Rosh Hashanah? When we say the ten verses of King Shepusim on Rosh Hashanah, What's the tenth one? Who remembers? The Chazan always raises his voice. This is what Chazan really shows off that he has a strong voice. He really picks up his voice. Huh? Now, the, what's, the, what's the last poster? Ubisayros hakosu vlevor? No? You know why you don't know? Because it doesn't say the word melech. No, anyone remember? Shema Yisrael Hashem Alekeinu Hashem Echad. Look at Musa. In Malchus. The tenth pasuk is Shema Yisra. Now the Mishnah already asks. There's a machlekes in the Mishnah. Shema Yisra Hashem Alekeinu Hashem Echad. Where do you see the word Melech? Where do you see anything about God being a king? So there are Tanaim that hold it's not a kosher pasuk for Malchus. 
Now, technically, you know why we use it? Because there's no other Pasuk in Chumash that mentions God being king, only three. God could have made another Pasuk that says Melech. And especially since the whole idea of Rosh Hashanah is to reveal God's kingship. God was king before anything was created. When God created the world, what's our purpose is to reveal His being king? So the Rebbe asks a bomb question on the whole Rosh Hashanah. Ten Pesukim Malachi is when we correlate God as king. And the grand finale, number ten, Shema Yisrael, Shem Akeinu Shem Echad. No word of God being king doesn't mention the word king. So the Rebbe explains this how beautiful. Because Shema Yisrael is the only Pesuk that shows how God's kingship is not like a physical king. A physical king, you and the king are two different things. You might be loyal, you might love the king, but you're two different entities. You don't live in such a way that your whole life is about the king. You don't live in such a way that every single detail of your life, how you eat, how you put on your shoes, is nothing other than the king. Shema Yisrael, Avaya Echad, God is one, is living in a way of redemption. Being redeemed from any separate entity from God. If you're not one with God, you're not redeemed. If you feel that there's any aspect of my life that's not the light of God, I'm not redeemed yet. This parsha, the Rebbe says this week's parsha, Ki teitzei la melchama, the first three words, Ki teitzei la melchama, when you go out to war. So you know how the Rebbe reads these first three words from this parsha? Ki say, as soon as the Jew's soul leaves Atmos, the essence of God, la melcham, you've already gone to war. As soon as you're not one with God's essence, it doesn't matter whoever says your soul might be in the world of Atzilos, your soul might be in some, in Gan Eden, in some divine realm. Ki say, you left Atmos, a Jew is not one with God's essence, la melcham. You're already at war. You already went to war. Because for a Jew has to live in a way of redemption. And that's the third explanation of the words Ani Lidoidi. Ani, my I, Lidoidi, is nothing other than Doidi. My I becomes consumed and unified and has no entity other than Doidi. I am Doidi. And you all understand this and carefully, that that's what it means to consummate our relationship with God. What does it say by a chassan and a kala? A chassan and a kala might be in love. But the Torah teaches, that the chassan and kala have to become one flesh. The chassan and kala have to be one flesh. And that's what it means, that we become redeemed, that we become one flesh with God. Explain what I mean. I've seen this question asked a lot of times, especially by our our feminist sisters among us. Why do we refer to God in the masculine? Today I've seen recently. I just saw a book. Somebody said from Princeton University. Someone put a whole book, an academic, that referring to God as a sheep. Sheep. So the question is, why do we refer to God in the masculine? Why, why, why he? Why do we? I'm sure you've heard that question. You know what the real answer is? You know what the real answer is? Because we are the feminine aspect of God. That's the answer. We are God's feminine aspect. All the mental images that we have of God, all the words that we think about when we think about him as being the other, the transcendent, the aloof, great, mighty, infinite. That aspect of God being above us, that's the masculine aspect of God. We are God's feminine aspect. They're both not God's essence. Soyvet kol almen, God's infinite light, his transcendent light, his masculine aspect, is not his essence. 
just as his feminine aspect, which is his indwelling, permeating life, a malikulam, which is shechina, which is what we are, they're both not his essence. In God's essence, there are no masculine and feminine. We're one with God. In God's essence, Yisroel v'kutshabrichu kulachav v'hoyu l'basar echad. One flesh. In Atzmus havaya echad v'hoyu l'basar echad. We're one flesh with God. It's just us and God. There's nothing else. That's that's redemption. That's what it means to be redeemed. And you all understand that's why. Why is the world so crazy about the union between male and female? Why does it make everyone nuts? Why has the world, you know, over the past couple of centuries, systematically descended into a cesspool where the whole purpose, the whole world is all about the male and female connection? Because that's what Mashiach is all about. That's the purpose of creation. The connection of the male and female aspects of God, which means us becoming one with God. And you all also understand that that's also why the source of life is that union. Because that's us being one with Hashem. And, and I'll take what, And therefore, that's what I'm saying. Kitetze, as soon as you leave God's essence, you're already not redeemed. There's a story from the Alter Rebbe. You all know that the Alter Rebbe has ten Nibunim, ten famous Nibunim. One of the famous Nibunim of the Alter Rebbe is Tse'enu Re'en. Another nigga is Tse'enu Re'en. Tse'enu Re'en is a Pesach in Shir Hashim, go out and see. I'm not really, singing is not my forte. I actually take from my mother's side of the family. We all have voices like frogs. I, but, but the nigga is more or less, my father's side of the family have beautiful voices, but my mother's side of the family, the nigga, Tse'enu Re'en, Tse'enu You know the story how the altar ever made that nigga up? The altar ever came to shul, Tishrei Rosh Hashanah, and it was too crowded in the shul. So they had to make a shalash, they had to make a big tent for the, for the minion to be there. So the altar ever said, they told me we have to go out of the shul. So the altar ever went into a state of tvekus, started cleaving to God, and when he woke up he said, Tse'ena, go out, Ure'ena, and see. If you go out of yourself, you could see God. You have to go out of yourself to see God. What does that mean? Because since our soul descending is we went out of God. That's how the war began. Redemption means going out of yourself and going back into Hashem. The Alter Rebbe's Moshal of Melech Besada, the king in the field. What does the Alter Rebbe say? What does the nation have to do to receive the king? Yoytzim Likrasa, they have to go out of the town to meet the king. You have to go out. You have to go out of your comfort zone. You have to go out of your comfort zone to become one back, one with Hashem. And that's what I'm That's the ultimate Ani Ladoi. Nisun, becoming one with Hashem. Being redeemed, living in such a way of Hashem Echad, that I feel that I have no detail in my life that's not God. I'm one with Hashem. And you all understand also that that's why Rosh Hashanah, we ask for physical things. That's the famous question. If Rosh Hashanah is about coronating God as King, then why do we ask for physical things that we need on Rosh Hashanah? How could I ask for, for health and parnasa sustenance and a good shidduch? How could I ask for physical things? I'm coronating the king. The answer is because God's kingship is Shema Yisrael Hashem Aleikeinu Hashem Echol. The real unity that I feel that my physical life is nothing other than God. And that's what I said to you before. You could be obsessed with God and still live in the physical world because if you're really obsessed with God, you're able to feel that your physical things is nothing other than His life. That's what it means to be obsessed with God. Not to negate the world, but to reveal how the world is nothing other than the light of Hashem. Now let's go back to the Pasuk, Kihar, Miyamushu. Let's go back to that now. Listen carefully, let's go back how we began. The mountains will crumble and the hills will fade away, but my love for you will not end. So the Altar explains this by bringing another Pasuk in Shir Hashim. Kol voice. 
Pasuk says in Shirashirim, the voice of Doibi, called Doibi, Hine Ziba, my beloved is coming, Medalik Alahara Mekapitz Alagvois, jumping from one mountain to the other, skipping from one hill to the other. Called Doibi Hine Ziba, Medalik Alahara Mekapitz Alagvois, jumping from one mountain to the other, skipping from one hill to the other. What does that mean, Nadora says? Right now, the world is in such a way, the hills and the mountains refer to different levels of Seder Ishtalshans. Different levels in the downshading of worlds. Different Sfirot, different divine emanations, different divine manifestations. Those are the mountains and the hills through which God's light jumps from one level to the other until it can finally reach us, the physical world. That's from above to below. What about from below to above? The Medrash says, that the Haram Vigvois, mountains and hills, are the patriarchs and the matriarchs. The Ovois, Avamitzik and Yaakov are the mountains. The matriarchs, Sarif, Gerachel, Valei are the hills. Because from below to above, they help us ascend to God. They are the mountains and hills that help us ascend to God. What will happen in the future? You know, the Gemara says in Shabbos, Thomas was others. Time will come that the merit of the forefathers, the whole time we keep mentioning Abba Mitzvah and Yaakov, their merit will stop. What's that? That's the time of Mashiach. When Mashiach comes, Paharim Yamushiv Agvais to Meten. There'll no longer be mountains, there'll no longer be hills. God's light will no longer come down from step to step through the world. And we will no longer ascend up to God through the patriarchs and the matriarchs. They're helping us ascend up to God. That's not going to happen anymore. Why not? Because when there's a nisuin, when there's the consummation with God, when we become one with God, there's no longer will be places for ascent and descent. It's just an ultimate unity with God. Heharim yamushu vagvais temaitena the mountains will fall, the hills will, will fade away, but my love for you will not end. That love, that ultimate love, the consummation of the love of us and Hashem, no more mountains, no more hills. How do we come to that? So the Alter Rebbe says, listen, the Alter Rebbe says, in this week's in the Haftar, right before Kiahar Yamushu, right before this puzzle, there's a puzzle right before that says, that God says, with great compassion, I will carry you, I will, I will, I will uh, bring you back to me. What does it mean with great compassion? Usually, upon whom do you have compassion? A nebuch case. Right? You know what it means, a nebuch case. A person that's a nebuch, a la A person that things aren't going well in his life. A person that things aren't going well, it's a lousy person. It really is a bad luck lost his money, something happened. You have compassion. That's Rachman. But the Navi says, Rachman gedoylem akapzeh. I will bring you back to me with great compassion. What does it mean, great compassion? <coughs> the Alter says, and this you have to meditate. Upon whom does God have compassion? People that are having, you know, a rainy Monday? People that are having a lousy time in life? God has compassion on all of Seder Ishtashos. The highest worlds, the highest levels of light, God has compassion on. Because anything that's not God's essence is nothing, is dust, is pennies. Anything other than God, imagine a person that lives his life in a speck of dust. That's what all of the worlds are, vis-a-vis God's essence. And there, Falter says, listen carefully, the Rambam says, upon what is Mashiach's coming based on, Ein Yisrael Nigolin Ela B'Tshuva. You have to do tshuva. Which tshuva? What about tzaddikim? Even tzaddikim. Chassidus explains there's a tshuva that even tzaddikim have to do. And more than that, listen carefully, See, this also says that this Shua that we're about to learn about is the one that we should focus on. Even though it could be that we did sins and we have to do lower levels of Shua, see, this says this Shua that we're about to learn, this is the one you need to focus on. 
Which tshuva? The tshuva of screaming out to God, Hashem, Ani Ledoiti. I want nothing but you. I want my soul to become unified with your essence. I don't want the mountains, I don't want the hills, I don't want the physical world, I don't want the spiritual world, I want God. Sois osis Bashem. Send a re'en. Go out of yourself, go back into Hashem. That's the secret of redemption, that's the end of the year, and that's the beginning of the year. And that's Mashiach. That's what it's all about. I want to just tell you a little story, a quick story. <clears throat> after World War II, after World War II, you know that during the Holocaust, the time of the Holocaust, so there were many Jewish children that their parents were taken away that were to concentration camps. And many, many parents left their children in covens by, by uh, churches, Ovens, monasteries. And there were tens of thousands of Jewish children that were lost because the priests and the nuns, they all promised that they would bring the children back. But yeah, they said, you know, watch after when whatever Jews back, you give the children back. And the priests and the nuns, you know, nodded. And they, they kept the children. There were those that gave back. Yohamra the Slusayat. Previous Pope, Pope John Paul II, Kiyadua, he was one of those who was very instrumental in bringing back hundreds of Jewish children in Poland. But most of them, they, they kept the Jewish kids. There were two rabbis, one was called Blazer Silver, or Blazer Silver from Cincinnati. Blazer Silver was the head of the rabbi of the American Rabbinic Association for the war. And Yitzchak Herzog, who was the, the first chief rabbi after the state was established over here, they went around Europe to find Jewish children. They both died very much and very quickly afterwards because their hearts were so broken. Because they saved, they found a couple of hundred, but all the thousands that they never found. So what was the way, how did they find the Jewish children? What did they do? Again, those that they did find. They went over to the monasteries, to the commons, they went to the nuns, to the priests, they said, there are Jewish kids here. No, we don't have any Jewish kids. So they said what they were going to do made the deal, but when they said to the Blaze of Silver and the hearts of it, they said, when the kids go to sleep, let us come into the room where the kids sleep. They would come into the room where the kids would be put to sleep. And as the kids lied in bed, they would start saying, start singing, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elikeinu, Hashem Echad, Ve'ahav Toes, and then there would be children that would start saying long in the room, there would be a couple of kids that would those that remembered from their mothers, when the mothers would put them to sleep, they would start saying along with them the Shema. And that's how they knew which kids were Jewish. But they both cried and became very broken. As I said, they died very much after. They both cried and they would say, they cried and they said, but imagine the thousands that the Shema Yisrael was buried so deep that they didn't remember. We have to make sure by ourselves and by all the Jews that we come into contact with that the Shema Yisrael shouldn't be buried deep. We have to do tshuva. What type of tshuva? Not tshuva about sins. Leave that for now. Let's do a more important tshuva. The tshuva that Mashiach's coming is based on. Eim Yisrael Nibel Nel B'Tshuva. To scream Shema Yisrael Havaya Echa to want to be redeemed from having any entity other than God. We want to come back to being one with God, one flesh with God. Sois osis bashem. Ani lidoiti. That my ani and my doiti should become one. That we have to reveal. Don't let that be buried within us. Reveal, we have to reveal it in every single detail of our lives. That's Elu. That's Rosh Hashanah. Sois osis bashem. And to tell other truths also, to say, become obsessed with God, not by negating your life, by feeling every detail of your life is the light of Hashem. That's the ultimate Ani Vidoidi. And in that schus, we're going to merit to see Hashem say to us, Vidoidi Li. And our beloved is ours, the Kamim Shitz and Kenim should be saved tonight.